So for the one person in the room I don't know, my name is Lance Fors and I'm the board chair of SVPI. And I wanted to talk to you today about a journey we began a couple of years ago, about what are we about? You know, what is our brand? What are we? And I think through a process that almost all of you participated in, we came up with this, which is unleashing potential. And I wanted to tie it into something that, that Nancy said to me. So as, as Claude said, you know, Nancy will tell you what you should do. And I remember a coffee that I had with Nancy a couple of years ago, and Nancy said, you know, you're the board chair of SV2, and that's, that's been okay, but you know, what you're doing won't be sustainable until you replace yourself. So I kind of filed that away. It took me 30 seconds to realize she was right, and I set on a path to be able to do that. And, and Nancy has those rare insights so that whenever she tells me something, I pay deep attention to it, and in 99% of the cases, I actually execute on it, and then it scares the hell out of her that you know, people pay that close attention to her. Uh, but she really is kind of my model for unleashing potential. So today I want to talk to you today about what that can mean for us on a couple different levels. What that can mean for us on an individual level, what that could mean for us on our SVP level at each of our individual cities, what it could mean in terms of our communities as we continue to grow and reach out into those individual communities, and what that could mean globally. So just to set the frame for you, I wanted to just tell you what you already know, and that is why is the work we do so hard? Well, if you step back from it and you say, we deal with nonprofits, and what do nonprofits do? They address problems that are politically unrewarding, because if they could be easily solved and could get a lot of credit for it, the politicians would have launched those initiatives already. Okay, they're financially unviable problems or the for-profit markets would have figured out the right solution. And yet they remain unsolved. So we're just sticklers for this, right? I mean, we'll raise our hand to that, right? That's the hardest problem out there. We're willing to jump in and go and do that. And we live in the most uncertain times in all of our lifetimes in this room. And, and this is what I call a VUCA world. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. So the ground is always moving. The deck is stacked against you from a political standpoint and a financial standpoint, and these are problems no one else has been able to solve, and we're all in. Right? We're all in. So if you think about this, this really requires leadership. And I think that's one of the things that attracted a lot of us to this. The answers are not easy. And because they're not easy, it requires a different level of engagement. It's solving the hardest crossword puzzles there are in the universe. These are complex problems. And I think what I've loved so much about the SVP experience, both locally and through the network, is to be able to do this in a deeper way. You get on the on-ramp, you find out things that interest you, you start to learn what's going on, and that learning gets deeper, and it forces you to think broader. And it forces you to go deeper and broader in your connections. So it's not only about what you learn, but it's about who you know and how you can work with those people. So I wanted to pose some questions to you today. How can we think about taking what we do today and unleashing incremental potential? And I want to do this at two levels. Look at it from the point of view of ourselves and the organizations that we work with, both the SVP and the nonprofits that we work with, and from the point of view of our community and our world. So at those kind of two levels. And I want to talk about the vision that we have today and the vision that I can kind of see cities begin to evolve into. So what I'm calling Vision 1.0 is what you'll see on all of our websites. And that is we build capacity. We build capacity of our partners, and lots of us have targets in our strategic plans, how we're going to go from X to 1.5X to 2X, and on and on. So build capacities of ourselves, both in the number, both in the quantity and the quality, and then build the capacity of the nonprofits that we work with. That's what's on our website today. And if I look at this, I can see a new vision evolving, which includes that plus something else. And yesterday afternoon, we had a board chairs forum, and all the board chairs who are here, about two-thirds to three-quarters of all the cities are around. And Larry Fox, who's the board chair of Portland, thank you, Portland, for hosting us. Larry made a really insightful comment. So for those of you who don't know, Portland, as a partnership, wanted, agreed to focus long-term on early childhood education. And they said they were going to be all in for early childhood education. 
and they wanted to be part of collective impact in greater Portland, and they wanted to lead the early childhood component of that. And Larry made an interesting comment in the board chairs forum yesterday, and he said, you know, we used to be social venture participants, right? Because we were participating in the grant rounds, we were investing in individual nonprofits, and through this collective impact work that we're doing, we're now social venture leaders in the community. And that's a, tr that's a transformative statement, and I just started thinking about that, right? Social venture participants to social venture leaders. And that's what I see evolving. And that's what I see partners who, once they've built the capacity in themselves and worked with nonprofits and want to figure out how to have a broader and deeper impact in their community, are gravitating to whether on an individual basis, like Bill Henningsgaard did in Seattle, starting Eastside Pathways, or on a partnership level basis, like the partnership did here in Portland. So what we're seeing then is this building capacity of the community and then having these rare opportunities to grow this movement globally. So for those of you who've already been through this, you know we have representatives here from SVP India, which just lodged in Bangalore. We have folks here from China, Ireland, and other countries that are very interested in how they can implement that model in their community. So Vision 2.0 is Vision 1.0 with this additional learning curve and impact curve about going deeper and broader. It's really about deeper and broader impact in the community. And then it's not so much what we do anymore, and our next speaker is Sam Kaner, who is all about facilitative decision making, group decision making, which is what we do. But the how around that is actually more important than what. I mean, it's the way you do it. And I think as we go forward and we get more sophisticated in what we do, how we go about doing that, moving from participants into more of a leadership role will be really, really critical. So again, I wanted to just put that up as a frame of reference to now dive into how could we think about unleashing more potential in ourselves and our organizations. And I wanted to use myself as a guinea pig who seven years ago Googled venture philanthropy. Didn't know squat diddly about it and up popped an article in Business Week that talked about SVP and the local SVP in Silicon Valley, SV2. So I decided, geez, you know, I just sold this business and was I gonna do another startup or not? And I needed to sleep a little bit at that time just to kind of get my senses back. So I decided I'd take a mini sabbatical and try out this venture philanthropy thing at SV2. Had no idea what was gonna happen, right? I thought six months, we'll see what goes on. And so what I found out over that, and it's a random walk, and each one of us has our own story and our own journey, and when you tell it in retrospect, it seems like a straight line, you just connect the two dots and it's all perfect. It ain't perfect and we all know that. Okay, it's a random walk and sometimes you wonder, what the heck are you doing this for? You aren't making any progress. So for me, it was that sabbatical, and, and it kind of stepped back for me about, you know, what was my best use? Was my best use to make another pot of money? or was my best use to figure out how I could use the money I had and the time and the talent I had today? So that was my question in 2005. And looking back on it of seven years of, and I thought I worked hard in the for-profit sector, like 80 hours a week. Well, I work harder now and I have more fun and I sleep less and I get more exercise. <laughs> so it's all cool. <laughs> So I, I joined SV2, and I used SV2 as a filter to find the best and brightest nonprofits. They only picked the best in Silicon Valley, and we got a whole lot of nonprofits in Silicon Valley, right? So then I used their portfolio, and I picked the best of those and got involved with some early stage organizations, reading partners that a lot of you know about who presented last year, New Teacher Center, who was in the um, case study that we did on Thursday for all of the nonprofits that are here. And that led me really to social venture partners because you could not only go deep locally, but oh my God, there were other cities that did this kind of thing. Whoa, that's cool. So that got me involved in the network. And then as I began to work with nonprofits, I began to see that you know, this ecosystem in the nonprofit space, it sucks, right? It's really hard to find money. It's really hard to find talent. It's really hard to have programs where how do you engage with your community? So organizations like Strive and Collective Impact, organizations like the Social Impact Exchange that really aggregates and makes more capital available and aggregates funders around things became to be really interesting. But in retrospect, where I really learned the most of everything I did was I just started having coffee with people. I just said, you know, you're a really interesting organization. I admire what you do. Would you be willing to have a cup of coffee? And those are my kind of thought partners. So I have about 40 folks that I have coffee with once or twice a year. 
and they work in all fields, and they work on all continents. And because of that, I kind of get a snapshot of what's like going on in India and in health, and you know, what's going on in China in uh, domestic worker education, vocational training. So it gives you this ecosystem view. So some of the points that are gonna come next are just my personal philosophy, but I put it out there as an example of different ways that people can think about themselves and maybe unleashing more potential in yourselves. And, and the core thing that's been so helpful for me, and it took me six years to get around to it, because you know the hard stuff you always put off till later, was like, you know, we have core values and we have a vision for our organizations, but do we have one for ourselves? Right? Do we have one for ourselves in the work that we want to do this way? So I finally shamed myself in this taking some time last year to come up with some core values for me. And I put these out there as examples. And those of you who know me will understand that these are pretty much spot on. Um, so my biggest goal in all of this, in terms of my core value, is to really focus on impact. I'm all about, as Free the Children was in last night's presentation, I'm all about growing things 10x and 100x. I mean, where's the fundamental disruptive innovation and disruptive impact? And to do that, you have to move fast, you have to be bold, you have to be open, you have to build trust. So that, for me, is my five core values. And as I've said this many times before, if I tell you that, you can predict my behavior. You will be 100% right. If I give you two scenarios and you put it against that filter, you will know what I will do. I'll be 100% predictable. And then the vision, you know, what's the vision? What's your personal vision that you're bringing to this? So to me is, I didn't really know the answer, but I knew I had to figure out by experimentation what my highest and best use was. So it's just a process, it's a journey, it's a walk. And to understand that, okay, that may be your highest and best use today, but as you gain more skill sets, as you build a bigger network, that highest and best use may evolve over time. So as you begin to think about this for yourself, and the other part of the vision that, that I really got excited about when I kind of really codified it on paper, is that in those cases where it's a big, hairy problem, and you really believe in that big, hairy problem and the opportunity that's there, start to reverse engineer about how you would get there. If you're Teach for America, it's all one day all children, right? It's always one day all something, right? So if you really believe that secret sauce and that, that organization has that potential, how are you going to overcome the structural barriers to get to all? So I really challenge you then individually and at the organizational level, what are your personal values that you bring to this work? And what is your vision that you bring to this work? And some of you have heard me say this before. One of the things I love most about this work is they can't fire you because they don't pay you. And that's really important because, you know, I think I got 40 good years more doing this. I'm going to know a little bit more in 40 years than I do today. So I think that's what's really important. I mean, everybody I see in this room is really committed to this work. And that means that you have time and energy and a learning curve ahead of you. So really decide, you know, what you want to bring and what you want to get out of this. And that applies both to individuals and to organizations. So now let me move to what I would call version 2.0. And that's really unleashing potential in the community and in the world as a global parameter. And let me just start with a snapshot of where we are as a network. So where we are as a network today is we're in 29 cities in four countries, US, Canada, Japan, and now India. 2,300 partners. $46 million invested, but that's $46 million of check writing, the checks that we actually wrote. That doesn't include the amount of co-funding that we brought along. That doesn't include the amount of in-kind advisory and consulting services that we brought to that. And we have collectively 550 organizations. So I would say that's good. I would say that's very good, but I would challenge us to say that's not great. We are still one of the best unkept secrets on the planet. So how do we strive to greatness? Well, first let me talk about what's changed in the last year. So in the last year, we've actually added over 200 new partners to the movement. So that's a 10% increase in the number of us around the globe. One very important thing we did also was we realized that we really didn't ask people 
to give more if they could. So there's a movement. We had a spring training in Scottsdale in April around this concept of asking matters. And a number of cities have implemented it where five or six thousand dollars a year is not the floor. Okay, it's not the ceiling, it is the floor. And those people who have capacity and believe in the mission can give more. And we've been doing this at SV2 in Silicon Valley for a number of years. You can look at last year's annual report where we break down the giving by levels. And you can see that several hundred thousand incremental dollars came in by those people who gave more than $5,000 a year. So that's another really important thing that happened last year is thinking of this not as a, as a ceiling, but as a floor. And then the number of SVPs increased 16%. We added four new cities, going from 25 to 29 cities. We added Chicago. We added Bangalore. Is Artie here in the audience right now? Could you stand up? I want to single you out again. So thanks to the efforts of a number of Seattle partners, Will Poole, Janet Levenger, Batati Ghosh, started to make trips to India to see if the model of SVP could work in India, did a lot of background inter interviews, 50 plus one-on-one -on -one interviews to determine that the model could work and what the pricing for the model should be. And really, it's not really SVP Bangalore. We really think of it as SVP India. And it's a platform to be able in a stage rollout to grow to five to 10 SVPs across India in the major cities in India. So we're very, very excited about those two new launches, Chicago and Bangalore. And we're also extremely excited about existing partnerships which have seen the value of the network and wanted to join the network. Is Kiki Mills Johnson in the audience anywhere? Can you stand up, Kiki? So, so Kiki is the executive director of Full Circle Fund in San Francisco, which has been up and running for 12 to 13 years and attracts a demographic that we, most of our social venture partnerships covet, which is their median age is about mid-30s. So they have a lot of people young in career, high energy. So we're extraordinarily excited to have Kiki. And is Dennis Kavner in the audience? Dennis, can you stand up? So Dennis is the founder of Innovation Plus in Austin, Texas. And Dennis and Innovation Plus also joined the network this year. And I think that's a really important change, right? I mean, we're about venture philanthropy. We're about social innovation. We're about focusing on impact. And these are organizations that have exactly that philosophy. And the value of that network increases as the number of people and the number of organizations increase. So we're extraordinarily happy to welcome those organizations. We've got a number of other guests in the audience from other existing partnerships which follow our same model that are interested in joining the network. So we think this is a really important trend as we think about leading this as a global movement. So now let me switch to the really fun stuff. So that's great, but how could we unleash more potential? And how could we think of it in two dimensions, both going deeper, which that's most important. How do we have more impact locally and in the network that we have? And then how do we increase the breadth of the movement? So as I mentioned before, with Larry Fox's insight that social venture participants to social venture leaders as a potential track within any different partnership, let's talk about increasing depth. And a number of us, when the first articles on collective impact came out about the Strive Partnership in Cincinnati, got all excited and ran off to the first seminars. And it's really nice to do collective impact where we get all the key stakeholders in the community involved. And we've got 70 people, and we've got working groups, and we've got to get everybody on the same page, and we're herding cats. And if you want to hear how ugly this can get, come to the workshop we have on at 11.15 today. It's hard, hard work. But what it does say is collective impact is a form of collaboration. It's probably at the far right end of the bell curve because it's the highest touch and most in-depth form of collaboration, trying to get all community stakeholders engaged around a key issue. But collaboration is really that first step. 
It's from just looking internally at the processes, doing a grant round and making one or maybe two grants a year, to both looking internally and externally to saying, how can I collaborate with the community? It could be co-funding, it could be co-capacity building, it could be both, it could be with one other organization, it could be with multiple organizations. But that's the beginning of that striving towards how do we have incremental leverage? So collaboration with collective action at one far end of that bell curve is one of those examples. Another example, as you all know, is the speed at which the social innovation fast pitch, that's the acronym for those of you who are up on all the acronyms, SIFP, social innovation fast pitch, which started in LA and then also started kind of in parallel in Dallas with the Big Bang. But it was the whole idea of really engaging the community and coming up with a process that allowed people to become more aware of who we were and to run a very, very interesting and engaging process that engaged nonprofits that even if they didn't win, they got very valuable brand presentation and coaching exposure out of it. So these are just different variations that we can see emerging. And we're all probably doing some of that in any one of our SVPs, which is making us go deeper into that community. So that we're not just considered an island floating out there, but we're considered a pillar of the community. And it's really funny, I've seen it in Silicon Valley over the last year or so, when you start to get engaged in all of these things, people start to think of you as a piece of the civic infrastructure. And that's how funders talk about us now, is that we need you guys at the table. You're a pillar of this community. So that's the transition, I think, and the potential around increasing depth. So let's talk about increasing breadth. How do we leverage the fact that we have 29 cities today and we could have a lot more tomorrow in terms of what we can do locally and what we can do globally? So first of all, I want to, again, recognize the power of the forums. So a number of years ago, we started having staff days, both at this annual meeting and the spring meeting. And those were very powerful for staff to connect and have learnings around key topics of the day. Nancy, our Paul Shoemaker award winner, several years ago started one for the board chairs of all the SVPs, which has become extremely important in terms of connecting, spreading knowledge, um, and leveraging the collective skill sets of the group. Uh, we just launched last year, after Jeff Edmondson spoke about collective impact, a forum around collective action, which is all aspects of collaboration. How do we be more collaborative? So those have become very important. And I think what we saw on Thursday, and, and it, when we put out this idea that we were going to have this scaling impact day and we wanted each city to invite one nonprofit that they felt was most scale ready, not only did we get like, more than one nonprofit from a lot of cities, but we got all the partners that wanted to come. So for those partners who couldn't fit in the room because the fire marshal said there was no way, we are actually going to hold that again on March 21st. So you can put it right in your calendar and your iPhone. March 21st in Scottsdale, Arizona, we will repeat that day and probably bring in a few extra phenomenal speakers. But what, but what Thursday showed us is that we have tremendous value for our nonprofits because today it's the partners in that city and it's the knowledge in that city that gets pushed down in the city to help the nonprofits in that city. But we aren't leveraging the breadth of the network. So what we did on Thursday was really the first at scale attempt to leverage the breadth of the network, right? To be able to bring in the leading foundation in scaling in the world, Edna McConnell Clark is one of our key speakers, to be able to bring in national experts in all of those areas and to be able to present that to some of our best and brightest. And we also are able to then have our partners get to spend two to three days with the executive directors and the board chairs of those organizations to be able to leverage the footprint of the network. So I think that scaling impact day really showed us that there may be a role for mixing our nonprofits with our partners at certain occasions. And then lastly, I just want to thank Elizabeth Benedict and her team on the work that they've put in on making this a global brand. Um, this is you know, leadership without easy answers. And we've got cities like SV2 that's going to celebrate its 15th anniversary next year when you all come to Silicon Valley on, on October 19th, October 17 to 19. 17 to 19, Palo Alto, California. Um, it's a global brand. And that's really, really important. And it's a very powerful message. And I can just tell you that the number of people that come up to me today and say, 
this makes sense for us, we want to join that, is amazing because opposed to one year ago. One year ago, we waited for the phone to ring. We've become proactive in the last year. Not only does the phone now ring, but people come to this conference in a proactive way to seek us out and to understand the model. So that, to me, is the beginning of a transition from good to great. We ain't anywhere near great, but we're moving in the right direction. That is clear. And it's really all, I think, in retrospect, all been around what are the things that we can do today? We can't do everything today, but we can do some things today. What are the things that we can do today about increasing the depth and increasing the breadth of the impact that we have? So let me just briefly talk about where we could go. So also in the board uh, chair's forum yesterday, Claudia, the chair of LA, said that they had for the last year really struggled with an impact statement for SVP LA. And was the focus going to be on the nonprofits or was the focus going to be on the partners? And with the nonprofits, it's, as we all know, we work with them and can we really isolate the impact we had from the impact that everything else in the planet had on them? It wasn't easy. So what LA decided to do was to make their key metric the focus on the partner and the number of partners and the amount of impact that those partners had. And they have this hugely audacious goal of growing like between five and ten fold to 500 partners over ten years. But even if the, no one if actually achieves that, even if you say over the next ten years, on average, every city doubles the number of partners. Double the number of partners over ten years. Sounds like a lot of work, but potentially doable. But we also know that the footprint is increasing dramatically, right? We're in 29 cities. If I added up the number of cities in our pipeline that are really interested in becoming SVPs in a stage fashion, I can get to 10. I could even get to 15, and that's just today, in our very early days of being more proactive about this. So what if we increase the number of cities sixfold over a decade? I mean, it sounds like a big number, but I don't necessarily believe that it's undoable. If you just do the simple math, that would give us 40,000 change makers in 200 cities. 40,000. That would be on that day, 40,000 partners. Some of those partners may have moved and be alumni. So if you rolled up the alumni, it would be 100,000 people that believed in this as a philosophy of life. The most successful alumni program in the world, in my opinion, is the alumni program of Teach for America. 70% of those people stay active in the education space. And they are now senators, and they are now congressmen, and they are now superintendents of a large school district. And I think in my lifetime, one of them will be president right, of the United States, of Canada, of other countries. Right? So they will have enormous political reach. And today, they have 20,000 alumni. In 10 years, we could have 100,000 alumni. That's what I think is possible through the simple law of growth. And my question for you then is if we had those number of change makers and if we continue to work in an incremental fashion to network and connect ourselves better and leverage best practices, how much incremental impact could we create? And I ask you to ask yourself that question at four levels. How much incremental impact could you have by tapping into that knowledge and network? How could much more impact could the organizations that you work with and care about, including your SVP, have? As you go deeper in your community, how could that change the complexion of what's possible? And as you think about this globally in a global brand, which will be in 200 cities in 30 to 40 to 50 countries around the US, what would that look like? So a couple of closing reflections. What we do here matters deeply. So that's a statement. But let me just try to paint that with what I mean. I think it matters deeply because we all care about our family, right? We have our nuclear family, which is you know, our spouse and our kids. We have our extended biological family. We have our SVP family in our city. We have our community as we get more deeply engaged in what that really means and when we have our planet. So to me, I think what all this will do over time is expand the definition of family and make it a heck of a lot more fun party to go to. I think that's what's really going to happen here. And on the plane here on Wednesday night, I was bored. And we were just landing in Portland. I pulled out the Alaska Airlines magazine. I'm just looking at all the pretty pictures of all the ski resorts that Alaska Airlines flies to. 
And I came across a quote, which to me really tied it all, is why does it matter so deeply? I mean, we know it, but we don't know it. And there was a quote from the CEO of Alaska Airlines, and it was from Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine. And what it said is, our greatest responsibility is to be a good ancestor. Our greatest responsibility is to be a good ancestor. So that's really what we're charged with when you think about it and you boil it all down. And I believe that our values at a personal level, and that's why I'm so, so urging you to start to think about values and vision at a personal level, are the rocket fuel. This is what gets us into the stratosphere. So I'm just gonna leave you with a question here today and, and ask you if, if you reframed how you think about unleashing potential. If you reframe that for yourselves and how you think about it, how your organizations think about it, how your community could think about it, and how we could think about that globally, what could that unlock? Thanks, everybody. We're gonna take a five-minute break, and then we're gonna have Sam Kano.